To review, the environment provides us with many services. The environment, however, also presents a few hazards. Some of these environmental hazards are of our own making, and then there's the times we must humble ourselves and understand that we are part of nature, just like everything else. And nature can be cruel. There are four general categories for environmental hazards. Physical, chemical, biological, and cultural hazards. Physical hazards are ones that occur naturally and we really can't do much to prevent them. Things like earthquakes, volcanoes, and floods. While we cannot prevent them, we can prepare for them and study the earth systems to predict them and minimize our risk. Chemical hazards are the synthetic chemicals that we have produced, like pesticides, disinfectants, and a few pharmaceuticals. There are, however, natural chemical hazards like arsenic and lead. Biological hazards refer to viruses, even though they're technically not a living thing, bacteria, and a few other pathogens. Infectious diseases are diseases that can be transmitted between humans in a population, and it's difficult to avoid these risks, but we can reduce the likelihood of an infection. Cultural hazards are those that result from the place we live, our occupation, and our behavioral choices. This falls in line with uh, drug use, diet, crime, and let's start with the chemical hazards. We've already discussed the health effects of a few pollutants like lead poisoning and cancers caused by pollutants and lung damage from pollutants. These chemical hazards are broken down into five big types. Neurotoxins are substances that can damage nerve tissue, including your central nervous system and your brain. Common examples of neurotoxins are lead, mercury, and ethanol, which is the active ingredients in the alcohol we drink, or you should not drink until you're 21. And even then, don't drink, it's silly. Carcinogens are substances that cause cancer. These act most commonly by damaging DNA. Asbestos is an example of a carcinogen that causes the lung cancer mesothelioma. But carcinogens can also be physical hazards like sun exposure when you're not wearing sunscreen, which can lead to skin cancer. Teratogens are chemicals that cause birth defects. The PCBs we discussed in the water pollution video are an example, and one that was common for a while was a chemical called PFOA, which was used in the production of Teflon, the non-stick coating on many of your frying pans. Endocrine disruptors are chemicals that affect our endocrine system, our, the hormones in our bodies. Hormones are chemical signals that our cells use to communicate with each other. Every hormone has a specific shape that matches a receptor protein on our cells. Endocrine disruptors are chemicals that are shaped just close enough to our actual hormones, and they work by either blocking our hormones from attaching to their proper receptor, or they mimic them so closely that they induce too much of a response. The old pesticide DDT is an example of an endocrine disruptor. Allergens are a bit of a weird one, and that's because they affect all humans a little bit differently. See, allergens are technically not dangerous substances. They're just things that your body recognizes as dangerous and induces an immune response against them. While most allergies are benign and just cause obnoxious symptoms like sniffles during pollen season, some allergies are deadly because the immune system overreacts by so much and the body enters anaphylaxis. Many of your teachers will probably ask you to fill out a chart of important toxins. Many toxins fit into more than one category. Uh, many endocrine disruptors, for example, are also carcinogens and teratogens. So just be aware of that as you're working through any potential assignments. The context of a question will become very important in this unit. So how do we measure how dangerous a certain substance is? A dose response curve describes the effect on an organism or mortality rate in a population based on the dose of a particular toxin or drug. The way this works is you introduce a higher dose of a substance to test organisms like mice, and you observe what percentage of a population dies as a result of that dose. Dose response curves are commonly measured based on a dosage, milligrams of a substance per kilogram of body weight. What's important to note is that the dose makes the poison. Many substances will have a threshold where any dose below the threshold doesn't result in any negative health effect. 
This is how the EPA determines the ambient air quality standards and the clean water standards. There are two types of dose response analyses that we commonly see. An LD50, or the lethal dose 50 test, seeks to determine the dose of a chemical that is lethal to 50% of a population of a particular species. The lower the LD50, the more toxic the substance is, because that means a larger percentage of the population dies at a lower dosage. An effective dose 50 test, or an ED50 test, is a test that seeks to determine the dose of a chemical that is effective at treating a condition to 50% of a population. This is commonly done by medicine manufacturers. They try to determine the effective dose of, say, a painkiller or the sleep aid that will actually, well, improve symptoms. Let's move on to the biological hazards or the pathogens. But before I move on, I really need to explain that pathogens are any disease-causing agent. These can be viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoans, a few others. Viruses act by entering your cell and hijacking your cell's machinery to make copies of themselves. Bacteria cause a disease by excreting toxins when they enter your body. They can also cause diseases in other ways uh, that's difficult and outside the scope of the class. Fungi can make you sick by invading cells and disrupting their functions, or by acting like parasites, consuming energy and nutrients otherwise needed by their host. Protozoans, which are single-celled eukaryotic organisms, cause disease in a similar way, acting as parasites and damaging your body tissues. We found ways to deal with these, right? We've developed vaccines to combat viral infections, antibiotics for bacterial infections, antifungals for fungal infections, and antiprotozoans to deal with, well, the protozoans. They're named very appropriately. Pathogens can adapt to take advantage of new opportunities to infect and spread through a population. And many pathogens are common in poverty-stricken low-income areas because they often lack sanitary waste disposal and have contaminated drinking water supplies. Uh, some pathogens are airborne and are spread through the air by the pathogen attaching to suspended particles in the air, like dust and respiratory droplets and water droplets. This is actually common. It includes things like the common cold and the flu that are airborne this way. Some pathogens are bloodborne, meaning they spread through blood-to-blood -blood contact, like HIV AIDS. Some pathogens are waterborne, meaning they are spread through infected drinking water, like cholera. And some pathogens require a vector, which is any organism that carries and transmits disease. An example of a vector is a mosquito, which is the vector that is responsible for transmitting the West Nile virus. Plague is a disease carried by organisms infected with the plague bacteria. Yes, that plague, it's still around. A handful of people get the plague every year in the United States and well, around the world more commonly. It is transmitted to humans via the bite of an infected organism or contact with the fluids of someone who is infected. Tuberculosis is a bacterial infection that typically attacks the lungs. It is sped by breathing in the bacteria from the droplets of an infected person. Now, tuberculosis is one of the diseases we are very worried about right now because there are populations of this bacteria that are totally resistant to our strongest antibiotics. Oops. Malaria is a parasitic disease caused by bites from infected mosquitoes. Malaria is caused by a protozoan parasite called plasmodium. West Nile virus is also transmitted to humans from bites via an infected mosquito. Now, here's where the mosquito thing really gets crazy. You'll see that mosquitoes are a vector very commonly. And the range of mosquitoes that carry these diseases is expanding as latitudes farther away from the equator are becoming warm enough to support a greater mosquito population. Another thing global warming is messing up. More diseases. I shouldn't be happy when I say that. Zika is a virus that is spread through infected mosquitoes. But Zika can also be transmitted sexually. Cholera is a bacterial disease that is contracted from drinking infected water. This is why water is not safe to drink in many parts of the world because, well, they don't really have a set drinking water system. SARS, or Severe Acute Upper Respiratory Syndrome, is a viral respiratory illness that is transferred from animals to humans and then can be spread between humans through respiratory droplets. Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, 
is also another viral respiratory illness that was spread from animals to humans. SARS and MERS are both in the coronavirus family. And now it's time to address the elephant in the room. SARS-CoV-19 is a respiratory illness caused by a coronavirus. It was first detected in China December of 2019 and had since spread throughout the entire world. At the time of me updating this video, August of 2023, there were a total of 769 million cases around the world with a near 7 million deaths. However, according to the World Health Organization data, about 13.5 billion vaccine doses have been administered globally, which reduced the amount of confirmed cases by 94% in just the first five months since the vaccine was made available. It is estimated, based on a 2022 study by the Commonwealth Fund, that in the U.S., just two years after the vaccine was administered, it had prevented 13 million hospitalizations and it prevented more than 3 million deaths. But let's look at what made this virus so terrible to begin with. Because it is spread through respiratory droplets, the denser population is, the faster the rate of transmission. Wuhan, the city where this virus was first identified, is one of the largest cities in central China with a population density of 13,000 people per square mile. After spreading, this virus quickly took hold in other regions around the world that are also big economic and travel centers with high population densities, like the Lombardia region in Italy, Madrid in Spain, London in the UK, and New York and LA in the United States. But what does all that have to do with environmental science? We need to talk about the link between habitat destruction and viruses. Many of the emerging diseases around the world, SARS, COVID-19, new strains of the flu, Ebola, just to name a few, are what we call zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that have been around for a while, but limited to populations of wild animals that generally don't interact with humans much. When a zoonotic virus infects humans, we call it a zoonotic spillover, and these events are actually quite rare. See, viruses are very specific and generally only infect one type of organism, but viruses can mutate, and some mutations can make them infect other types of organisms. As more habitat is destroyed due to mining, urbanization, and deforestation, the area in which these organisms have to live is decreasing. It's increasing the population density of many animals, and animals come into contact more frequently with each other, and come into contact more frequently with humans, too. As a result, the likelihood of a zoonotic pathogen mutating and infecting other organisms increases. There are two main hypotheses surrounding the increasing likelihood and actual occurrence of zoonotic spillover. The first one is that the habitat range of organisms is decreasing. They are more likely to come into contact with humans, increasing the likelihood of a random mutation finding its way to us. The other is the dilution effect, which states that where species vary in susceptibility to infection by a pathogen, higher biodiversity leads to lower infection prevalence in hosts. Yes, biodiversity literally dilutes the spread of a virus. So yes, disease is very much an environmental science topic, and at the end, it's a problem of our own making. We fragmented habitats, making wild animal populations more condensed. We increased human population density without an investment in clean infrastructure. Disease is a density-dependent factor, influencing the carrying capacity of a population. And now, when economists, politicians, and media personalities don't have answers to our problems, people turn to scientists. And they ask them, well, why is this so bad? And the scientists, exhausted and underfunded, tried to explain that they've been talking about the potential for a global pandemic for a long time now. We just didn't care. <laughs>